Hi, thank you for coming and coming back, I guess, yeah, some of you. And uh, my name is Yutaka Takiura, Yutaka Professor Takiura. I'm teaching a, a, a design management program in Manhattan, which is business school. And uh, I've taught uh, interior design as well as uh, this school here in architecture in, in the past. So um, then I organized and uh, produced this uh, AI series three times, and tonight's the last, last one. And uh, thank you for Deborah and you know, back there. It, uh, this program is sponsored by Pratt uh, CCPD, uh, Center for Career and uh, uh, Professional Development. So that's announcement. Then uh, I have to ask you to remember this. Uh, when you have a question, uh, wait for microphone, they say. The reason is they are recording so that they can show later or other students who missed today can see it. But if you don't have microphone, nobody can hear what you're talking about. Then, uh, <laughs> so uh, if, you, um, if you don't have microphone, then ask somebody questions, and if she or somebody I try to answer, then have to repeat that question. What was that question? So uh, uh, grab microphone, wait for microphone. Don't be shy. So that's announcement. Then now, uh, Natalie Torres here. Hello. Okay. Yes. Yay. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Hello. Hey. <laughs> All right. I show humanity and. Uh, a, a, she is a, a trained as an engineer originally right? yes. uh, from, uh, from Columbia University, right. uptown, not South America, yeah. <laughs> I said. It's a different degree from South yeah. America. <laughs> yes. so, uh, and, but uh, now uh, she's a director of data at uh, Inamoto. And uh, Inamoto and the company, um, maybe you can explain a little bit what you guys do. Yeah. Yeah, so take it away. Yes, uh, well, thank you, Yutaka. Thanks, Deborah, and thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, and I guess I'll start with myself. Uh, I'm Natalie Torres, Director of Data in Emoto & Co. And we are located in the glamorous neighborhood of Gowanus, uh, Brooklyn. So a little further down on the G train. And uh, it's a small group, and we call ourselves a business invention studio. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions, what does that mean? Um, and what we like to say is we design what's next, we create what's next, and we do that sometimes with brands uh, such as Uniqlo or Toyota, uh, also Asics, uh, but we also do it solo. So we do it for ourselves. We're currently incubating a startup that's focused on family communication. And we do that because we believe in design, data, and technology, um, both equal uh, disciplines in our company because uh, to really create something that's user-centric or human-centric, we kind of have to understand it from a diverse, um, perspective, a diverse set of perspectives. So that's, that's Inamoto & Co. Um, and what I'm here to talk to you about today is artificial humanity. And that's um, really understanding like how is artificial intelligence intersecting our daily lives um, and how is it impacting, quite frankly, the human race. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but before I do, I'll start with a very short story. Uh, behold, this is, <laughs> this is me. This is me, seven years, seven years old. Uh, a young photo with the laser backgrounds and the neon green jumpsuit. Um, and I wanted to talk about this photo because of um, a memory that I had as I created this presentation about toys, toys that I played with. And I loved connects and Legos, that's why I'm an engineer, but I also love dolls. Uh, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with the American doll collection. Uh, and I mean, I, my family couldn't afford them, but I loved pouring over the catalogs and I desperately wanted an American Girl doll. But the original cast was actually um, here on the left, I think it's Samantha, Felicity, Addie, Kirsten, and then on the far right with the glasses, that's Molly. Um, and I, I just, I, I like these more than Barbies because they felt a little more uh, identifiable, a little more real to me. But soon after, they, I remember when they released Josefina, or Josephine, uh, and I was completely taken aback because finally they had uh, a, a, a doll that looked like me. Uh, she is from Mexico. I'm not Mexican. I'm Latina. I'm part Latina. And that was the closest thing that I had to like a doll that looked like me. Um, so at a young age, 
I wanted to identify with something that I could see myself in, uh, a reflection of myself. And so I really applaud American Girl Dolls for creating a diverse, or di diversifying, eventually over time, diversifying their collection of dolls. Um, actually, right now you can create your own doll with like whatever tone, skin tone, face shape, hair color, so you can really create an unlimited combination of dolls. Um, and and I, I tell you that story because it, I think about AI and how it's intersecting our lives and it's, it's truly made in our image. And those are some of the examples that I wanna show you today is how that's happening uh, because it's becoming more and more sophisticated every day. It's in toys, it's in vehicles, mobile phones, our medicine, government, business, anything you can think of, AI is becoming foundational to how it's working, not just changing it, but foundational. Uh, so again, I wanna walk you through a bunch of examples of how that's happening um, and how it's having an impact, both good and bad. Cool? Well, before, before I get into that, AI is a pretty broad topic, and uh, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page of what AI is. So this is like a thousand foot level of what, what I, how I define artificial intelligence. Um, so one, I think, really basic and helpful definition is AI is when a machine mimics human functions, such as learning and problem solving. So if we just take the first part of it, human functions, um, AI has been around for, I guess, a pretty long time. Uh, a calculator uh, is something that does a human function, and we've programmed a machine to do that. It was binary. It was early. Uh, but it, it did stuff that I kind of can't do anymore without using a calculator, to be honest. Um, and it's, it's later on with the learning and the problem solving where AI gets really interesting and where we've made a lot of um, advancements lately. Um, but AI is super broad. Um, I, this is one construct that helped me understand it a little bit. I thought sitting would be cool, but I'm gonna stand. Um, there's artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and artificial super intelligence. Uh, this chart is showing like what we mean by those three types of AIs. Uh, if you have on the bottom, it's just kind of like a timeline of advancement. And on the vertical axis is, for lack of a better word, like kind of like an IQ level. Uh, and where we're at right now is, is ANI, artificial narrow intelligence. It's mimicking something like a mouse or a bug. Uh, and that sounds like rather dumb, but I, I think that there are things out there that like bees, for example, that can create really incredible structures. So it, quite frankly, what we're making with ANI is super powerful. Uh, but when we get to general intelligence is when it's just as smart as a person. So maybe a dumb person, maybe a super smart person. It's just like that range of like human intelligence. And I think where Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking are getting really nervous is eventually we are hoping to create artificial super intelligence. And that is if we tap together all of our brains all over the world and created like a network. And that would be artificial super intelligence. It's something that's just way smarter than us um, and potentially uh, dangerous, right? But that's not what we're talking about really today. Um, but we're, we're at this spectrum right now. Um, so ANI, artificial intelligence in general, one of the first ways we achieved that was through traditional programming. Uh, maybe you've seen this before, but I found it very helpful to talk about the paradigms of how we create AI. Uh, so traditional programming, if anybody's learned Java or whatnot, is you have these inputs, and that's data. Um, you, you create the program, we create the program, and we kind of plug it into a computer and out pop the results, right? Uh, and that's worked for a very long time, but there are some drawbacks. It's, it's rather brittle, it takes a lot of time, it's not super adaptive. Um, so that's, that's where we started off, but something's happened since programming has um, been invented that is changing the way we program, and that's data explosion. So this is essentially, over time, how much data is being created year over year. And as you can see, it's like a hockey stick like crazy. Um, an exabyte, let me look at my notes, an exabyte is one billion gigabytes, or one trillion, or one million, sorry, terabytes. And in 2020, which is really not that far away, we're gonna be making 45,000 exabytes of data. Uh, and as the headline says, we're gonna make more data in the past two years than we've ever made with 
of all history leading up to that. So like data is exploding. And data is exploding for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, we have more devices. Uh, I think the average stat last time I checked was about seven devices per person. Laptop, cell phone, tablet, smartwatch, things in your home. But we're also wearing um, uh, biometric measurements. So Fitbit, your Apple Watch, and we're connecting our home. Light bulbs, forks, we're connecting everything. So we're collect collecting an abundance of data and we can store it for a very long time. Uh, we can store it because data, uh, storage has become super cheap and we can access it very easily because it's now in the cloud. And what that's enabling is uh, a change in the way we program and it's enabling machine learning. And machine learning is different from traditional programming because we still have the same inputs of data that we put into the computer, but instead of a program, we tell the machine learning algorithm what we want it to spit out. We give it the output. And the computer does all sorts of permutations and thinking, da 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 and it gives us the program. And this is powerful because it can find patterns that maybe we're not aware of. It can learn over time. It can optimize. Uh, so machine learning has, has been a relatively new uh, advancement that has changed a lot um, about how we think about artificial intelligence because it's no longer rules-based that humans are thinking of, but it's now pattern-based that computers are, are helping come up with those um, relationships. Uh, I don't think that we should be super worried, but uh, when you think about like the human brain versus like a computer, Here's some differences. Um, all right, right now it's going to look like the human brain's not doing too well because it's only firing information at a rate of 200 hertz uh, versus a gigahertz for a computer. So the computer right now is, is able to fire information off uh, more quickly. Um, the transmission of data is happening more quickly as well, um, almost at the speed of light where we're at about 100 meters per second. Um, and we're, we're limited by the size of our skull. Like we can't Maybe we can one day, but our, our brains really can't grow outside of our skulls, so we're, it's contained. Whereas computers, we can make more server farms, data farms. We can uh, theoretically create uh, a large enough uh, processing center. But despite all of these advantages that the computer has, um, right now the largest uh, network that they've been able to create is 10 billion synapses, so that's the equivalent, it's a par parameter, so it's equivalent to a human synapse. Whereas the human brain, despite the speed impediments, we're at a hundred billion neurons. So we're at like magnitude level greater than a computer. So even with machine learning, we're, we're, we're a lot smarter than computers. And I know we know this intuitively. Uh, but a great example I, li I like to share is uh, a hot dog detection contest between a child and a computer. Um, so a kid, you can show a kid a hot dog once, maybe not the brightest kid a hot dog, like 10 hot dogs, and they'll get it, they'll get it, right? It's, it's, it doesn't take them too long to understand what a hot dog is. Uh, but if you look at how machine learning works, you have to feed it tens of millions of images for it to understand what those patterns are. And even then, it's like, it's relatively brittle. Uh, a, an article I read earlier today is if you put an image of an elephant, just like an elephant in the photo, somehow the algorithm breaks down and it gets confused really easily. So it lacks common sense. Uh, but at any rate, I mean, machine learning is, is doing a lot. Uh, it's a subset of artificial intelligence. And deep learning, which is even newer, it's a way that we're modeling machine learning algorithms after the human brain is, uh, is doing a lot to uh, make, make these artificial intelligence uh, inventions even better. Uh, so deep learning, it's stuff like uh, what Google's doing, they fed deep learning into the Google Translate uh, function and overnight that got like almost natural the way it sounded, whereas before it was kind of like janky. It was a little more rules-based. So I wanted to share this because it's artificial intelligence is kind of like a very broad bucket. We've got machine learning, which is a technique, and deep learning, which is a specific advancement within uh, machine learning. So if we're all on the same page, 
thank you for following me on this journey, uh, I want to get into some of the ways that AI is intersecting our lives. So the first one is how we augment ourselves with artificial intelligence. Um, I think the earliest way that happened is with automation. So if it can be repeated, we can automate it. So, you know, this isn't an example of artificial intelligence. This is an example of just pure automation with robotics. It's the assembly floor of a car factory. Sorry about the graininess. Um, and it works because this assembly line, it's not meant to be variable. There's no problem solving that needs to happen. So these robots are going from one coordinate to the next coordinate, welding, and then back. And yet automation in this purely mechanical fashion threatened many jobs. Uh, and now we're getting to automation where the robots are getting smarter. So here's an example, sorry for the vegetarians in the room. Uh, this is an example of butchering lambs in New Zealand. It's a company called Scott Technology. And you know, butchers have to implement a lot of problem solving when it comes to bone structure and how joints fit together so that they can create a quality cut of, of meat, essentially. So what this system does is it x-rays the lamb. It identifies where the bones are and it comes up with an approach for how it's going to butcher that piece of meat. And not only is it using that sort of computer vision and deduction and problem solving, but it's learning over time based on how well it's doing that. So now there's a bit of a more threat to um, the, the employment line, but now you're getting a lot of repeatability, quality control, could be cleaner, you know, you can, you can save, uh, you can control for hy hy uh, hygienic environment. Uh, maybe you guys have heard of Amazon Go, which is a new grocery store concept that Amazon's creating. Essentially, anybody can walk in. It's supposed to be uh, a, a cashier-less store. You walk in, you tap in your phone, pick up whatever you want, put it in your bag, and just walk out. You don't pay at a cashier. Through computer vision, so being able to technically watch you everywhere you go, uh, sensor networks throughout the store, uh, as well as uh, you know, more learning algorithms, machine learning algorithms, it can understand what each customer is picking up and putting in their bag, even putting back on the shelves that they don't want, um, and then automatically charging them for that. So this is really cool. I thought this was very exciting. But one of the first headlines that followed this announcement was 2.3 million jobs affected, potentially affected by this new technology. Cashiers, not even just in grocery stores, but in you know, retail locations uh, across the world are threatened by this. Uh, and just recently in the New York Times, they talked about uh, how Amazon is deploying Alexas in hotels uh, to replace concierge. And the concierge, the, the hospitality staff, they're unionizing to protect themselves against the advancement, but not from a Luddite point of view. They're not trying to reject technology, but they just want to be part of the discussion with management about how it's going to affect their job. So, you know, when we employ artificial intelligence to help uh, augment the human, uh, the, the human decision, or to automate the, the human uh, role in the workplace, we're gonna get a lot more efficiency and perhaps even more benefits. But I mean, unemployment is a, is a big question and I'm sure you've seen it a lot. Um, but one thing that I thought was, was surprising that I forgot about it is inequality. If you have fewer people doing the low skill labor jobs and that, that money, that profit that they're making, it's not going into cutting costs, it's just going into the higher upper management. So the, the concern there is that there will be more income inequality uh, in society if we deploy AI, not just unemployment. Uh, next is about uh, intelligence, automation, uh, intelligence augmentation. So how can we help make ourselves a little smarter uh, or take out some of the low level decisions that we have to make? I use Google Smart Replies, uh, it helps. I don't use them all the time, it's not always right. But essentially, it's when AI is trying to help you, you know, take, remove some of like the, the, the bad, dis, the, not bad, the boring like rote tasks that you have to do every time. There's another uh, AI software out there that is to help schedule people, 
because how boring is it to be like, oh, I'm not free this day, I'm free this day, you know, just have AI figure it out. Um, other ways that we augment our decisions and designs um, is with this beautiful example, I don't know how to say the word, but it's, a, it's an opera house in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, and what's amazing about this design is not specifically the architecture, but throughout the walls they have these uh, cells. They call them acoustic cells, and there's probably over a million of them all over the interior of this, of this opera hall. And the acoustic engineer that designed this developed an algorithm that he told the algorithm, this is where, this is the type of sound dampening that I want, this is the type of sound amplification that I want, uh, and this is the architecture of the space. And the algorithm just plowed through a bunch of calculations, a lot of permutations, and then spat out this beautiful organic looking design that makes for the perfect listening experience inside this music hall. So potentially humans could do this, but you would need a much larger team to go through the calculations and do this, and yet one acoustic engineer was able to design this. Um, the robots are coming to help with recruiting. So they're using AI and perhaps uh, chatbots to help not only weed out resumes that aren't particularly qualified uh, for the job, but also to help screen initial conversations. So, I mean, AI has been part of, part of call centers for a very long time, but now they're part of some of this early on uh, hiring process. So it now behooves us to be really nice to AI because you don't know if you're talking to a human, if you're talking to a robot, and how that's going to affect your chances. But that makes sense because I've, I've been on the recruiting side before. You get a bunch of resumes. Maybe I didn't write the job description well, but it take, it's very time consuming to go through each resume and think, okay, this is not, they're not right for this role, they're not right for this role. And now uh, AI will come in and help speed that along. But I, I, I want to spend a lot of time talking back on the machine learning paradigm and, and why this is potentially uh, troubling. We have the input, so we, this is data that we're putting into it, right? The desired output is sometimes one metric, like is it miles per hour, quality of the resume, acoustic quality. Uh, you kind of try to refine the decision to a number or a way that, that that data is calculated, right? And then it points out a program. Now on the surface, this doesn't seem like that big of a problem, but as somebody who's in data, numbers can really obfuscate a lot of the story, and numbers can very easily be manipulated. Uh, this was an article that I read, it has nothing to do with AI, but it does talk about the importance of quantifying success. So the bottom line is the official unemployment rate, how it's officially calculated by governments. Uh, and the top line is how you could calculate it another way. And this is important because the unemployment rate is an important gauge on the uh, health of our economy. And right now, based on this data with the gray line, our economy is doing good. Because that employment number is kind of like sub five. But what we don't know about the unemployment rate, or maybe, maybe you do know, but I don't think a lot of people know about this, is that it only includes adults that are attempting to find work. What it doesn't include are adults that had tried to find work but have stopped because they feel it's hopeless, for example. So there are people, there are adults that are in, the, in a certain age range that are, are it, they're potentially gainfully employed, they're employable, but they're not looking for work because it, it, feels, it feels difficult to find that job. And, and frankly, I know people in my life that fit that description. So when we look at it that way, it, it looks a bit alarming. So there are more and more people that are not currently employed that could work, uh, but that are not looking for work. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that the numbers can really hide a lot of that. And these are the numbers that we're asking machine learning to optimize for. Uh, and what happens is we get programs that when we, they're black box for a long time. We don't know how it makes this calculation, but when we look at the results and, and, and investigate them, we're, we're seeing racist AI. We're seeing biased AI. And is it 
is it that the AI is racist? I, I really have a hard time believing that computers can be inherently racist. Uh, and it may not be that the people that are designing it are actually racist, but the data has these underlying signals and they're connecting desired output to the input and AI is finding patterns that may not be moral or ethical. So what's important is that how we train AI uh, and the data we put in it needs to be really, uh, what's what I'm looking for? We really need to interrogate those numbers a lot. And we need a lot of different people in the room to help interrogate that data. Because if you look at comparisons between face recognition software and the prediction of uh, guessing gender, uh, you know, the lighter males, 100%, 100% score across all three software types. Most engineers uh, statistically are, are white men. But when we get to, you know, people, minorities, uh, both from uh, a race standpoint and a gender standpoint, this is where it falls down. And it happens with face rec facial recognition software. It's actually happened even before AI with soap dispensers. You need to put your hand and it detects a hand. It didn't detect darker skin tones. So it's really important that we have people that are designing things and creating these things to be diverse because we're thinking about them from a different perspective. So when we augment our intelligence, we can focus our efforts on the really cool stuff and not on the drudgery, but we have to make sure that AI is not biased or we, we constantly have to check it and not just take it for its word. Because I know sometimes, at least in my field, people look at a number or a chart and they're like, okay, it must be right. And that's how I get through most of my job. Uh, <laughs> but it, I mean, everybody ha is invited to take the look at the numbers and, and question them because we should. Uh, and then I think the next, the, the next build on uh, uh, augmenting intelligence is just having autonomous. Um, AI. And one example that I, I certainly use is a robo-advisor. So this is somebody that um, I, I pay a service, they have these algorithms that are constantly checking stock prices, 401k prices, and they're making these trades. They never sleep. Seems perfect because it's much cheaper than hiring a financial advisor and it's much smarter than me. Um, so that's one way that, that like autonomous AI is um, part of our lives today. Um, people have talked about autonomous delivery vehicles that are taking items to the last mile. Uh, and, you know, it's really helpful. <laughs> and then you have Tesla that has, right now, it's not fully autonomous, but it's getting there, right? Uh, it's, it's rolling out more and more. We're starting to have accidents because of autonomous vehicles. But one report actually claims that a vast majority of those accidents that involve an autonomous car are because of human error, and it's not from uh, the autonomous algorithm. So that's great, because we have like the prospect of something that's more safe, uh, that you can have fewer accidents. Uh, but what happens when there's a situation where an accident is, in, is inevitable, and somebody's gonna die? How do we train AI to make that decision? Uh, some folks over at MIT Media Labs are asking that same question. And they have this thing called the moral machine, and you can check out that, that link and, and participate in the study, is uh, what does this autonomous car do when it's faced with three men, one is a child, and one's a doctor, and then three uh, women who fit the same demographics, they're just women, what, what should the car do? Uh, we're asking AI to make this decision, but what would we say in the room today? So, the MIT Moral Machine is meant to kind of crowdsource uh, ethics. Uh, and the quote from, from one of the prof professors there says, it makes the AI ethical or unethical in the same way that large numbers of people are ethical or unethical. So it's better to not put the hands, uh, the, the moral decision into one programmer's hands or maybe a small team of programmers, but maybe it, get, it takes all of society to kind of think about what, what were the decisions we would make. So when we have autonomy, uh, it could be great for quality control if you have self-driving cars or trucks that are not prone to accidents, but what is the AI value system that we're teaching um, these algorithms? Uh, the next section I wanna talk about is the personification of AI. So we talked about how AI is partnering with people, 
Now let's talk about how AI is becoming people. Um, excuse me. So this is Cynthia Brazil. She works at the MIT Media Labs. They're doing a lot of really cool stuff with AI. Uh, and she started Emotional Robots in the early 90s. Uh, and, and through her work and, and many other people's work at, at the MIT Media Lab, they broke down what it meant to have emotions, to telegraph emotions to the people around us. Uh, and so there are some apparent and less apparent signals that we give each other. Um, so I'll start first with the apparent. You know, there's facial expressions, intonation of the voice, posture. Uh, and you've probably seen this before, but now we're using computer vision uh, and tracking the eyes, tracking the face, the brow, and predicting what type of emotion this person is feeling. And it's become more and more sophisticated, and this is helpful because uh, there's some people out there that might need a little help. Uh, so the Stanford Autism Glass Project is one where they embed that same technology in a Google Glass. Um, and, not, and autism is a disorder where uh, it's difficult to uh, partake in social situations, sometimes because of a difficulty in, in reading emotions. So what the Google Glass will help the student uh, do is assess how people are feeling so they can have that information to have better relationships with the people around them. Because that is uh, understandably a difficult part of uh, relationships for people with autism. Now some effective responses or emotional responses that are not as apparent are things like respiration. So maybe you can't tell how quickly I'm breathing right now. I don't know who has, who's sweating over there or their heart rate is beating really fast. That's, that's information that you leave for the most intimate people in your life, or maybe you just don't, nobody tells you at all because you need the instrumentation to get to, let's say, blood pressure. Uh, this video, and it is a video, is of a guy. He's just sitting, I think he blinks to show that, yep, there he is, uh, that it's a video. Um, and through, again, computer vision and machine learning, what they've discovered is that every time your heart beats, your head actually kind of wobbles a little bit. It's very imperceptible, but they're accentuating that movement and they're tying it perfectly to a heart rate, right? Now you can see how, I can see how fast your heart's beating. Why do I need to know this information? Uh, here is a fantastic example of why that's helpful. Uh, a newborn baby, maybe a premature baby, uh, it's not, it's very invasive to put instruments on, the, on their body because the skin is so thin or it's just uncomfortable. But now we're able through augmenting pigmentation in the, in the video to understand what that heart rate is. And so you can kind of see that without being as in invasive. Uh, so that's, that's a fantastic application. Uh, but somewhere in some, some company, I don't know the name, but it's been rumored that some, a company in China can, can detect when you're lying just through video. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a quite an invasive um, technology because quite frankly, I mean, we kind of have a few white lies here and there, but, and that's, that's fine, it's not really hurting anybody, maybe, that's a whole other topic. But now we're, we're detecting everybody that walks by if they're lying or not. Whereas the last thing we had was like a polygraph test and that required a uh, heart rate monitor, you'd sit there and, and participate the, in, in this um, study. So now we have stuff like this where you can read that information through your face, perhaps perspiration, heart rate, and see if you're lying. So benefits are advanced healthcare. We're helping people uh, through this type of measurement and detection, but we also have the potential to invade an emotional privacy. Um, when it comes to communication, uh, you know, voice assistants are everywhere. It's in Google Home, it's in Siri. Uh, and for us to want to use it, just like that American Girl doll, we want to be able to identify with it. So what Google Home was doing is hiring people from Pixar and people from The Onion to help make the voice interaction of Google Home more natural. You know, it wanted a sense of humor, it wanted characteristics. Uh, and why do they want that to happen is because they want this Google Home in your home. They want Alexa in your home. So as natural as they can make that communication, the more likely you are to use it. Uh, and an interesting outcome of this is children. 
Children love Google Home and Alexa. My friend had to remove it from her house because 100 times a day, their daughter was, OK, Google, OK, Google. And <laughs> God. Um, but, but what's happening is now there's modes that try to teach your kids manners. You know, OK, okay Google, um, play Spotify, please, right? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Alexa, right? So it's, it's uh, you know, you have these kids that are growing up with voice assistants, and that relationship is being defined by how they communicate with these, with these devices. This is admittedly not an example of AI. This is just a robot, but Paro is um, a therapeutic robot for patients with dementia uh, because not all communication is verbal. Sometimes the communication is physical or uh, a little more subtle than that. Uh, but where this is leading us to is Pepper. Pepper is a, a brand new AI that SoftBank out in Japan created, and they claim that Pepper can read emotions and make people happy. There's a video that I wouldn't subject you to because it's a little bizarre. It's a, it's a single woman that's depressed and she's crying at home, and Pepper comes to console her. Uh, but that's, that's the future. That's what people are, are seeking. Um, and then if we pair it with some of the advancements in uh, creating robots, uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro has been doing a lot uh, with making robots more lifelike. So lifelike, in fact, that the first time I saw this, I thought the first half of that was actually him. Um, so when we're pairing these emotional robots uh, into ro in these emotional um, AI with robots and we're creating like this whole new thing to interact with that has unlimited resources technically. It can always read your emotions perfectly. Um, what does that mean for human relationships? You know, uh, So it has the power to strengthen connection or potentially undermine human relationships. Um, and then really quick, what it also means to be human, I think, is to be able to create art. So this is a, a painting that was created um, by three engineers. And it is the first painting that will be sold at Christie's. And it's estimated to be auctioned off for $10,000 later, later next month, actually. Um, and they were able to do this by pumping about 15,000 portraits of classical paintings over the past six centuries. Um, and they created this. Looks pretty good. Better than what I can do. Uh, little exercise <laughs> is here are two haikus. One is written by a human, and one is written by a robot. Um, so I'll read them off, and I'm going to get a show of hands to see who thinks which is which. A little boy sings on a terrace, eyes aglow, ridge spills upward. Or, this event's despairingly beautiful existence, to whom does it matter? Who thinks the left one is AI? Oh, oh, raise your hands. Okay, and who thinks the right one is AI? Oh, you guys are good. I thought I picked a hard one, but you guys are good. But it's, it's creating poetry. It's creating prose. AI is already being used to create really boring reports like stock prices, or it's being used by ESPN to talk about games. Maybe less boring. Boring for me. Uh, but it's, it's, it's creating. It's creating stuff that we might not be able to detect, or the lines between detection are becoming uh, really blurry. And I'm sure many of you guys have seen this, but deep fakes. I'm just going to play this. There's no sound, but uh, just watch. Does anybody recognize that? I don't think that's, I don't think that's Amy Adams. That's totally weird. It's Nick, Nick Cage. Um, I think, I think, I think it, it certainly looks bizarre, but because we know what Nick Cage looks like, he has a bigger chin. Uh, but it's, I think, seamless in the way that they've mapped on his face to Amy Adams' face. And this is created just by having sufficient source images of Nick Cage in different face like angles and lights. Um, and they just map it right on top of Amy Adams. Uh, you still need a lot of engineering and human intervention to make this possible. But they're already creating deep fakes of Obama, Vladimir Putin, uh, and, and Trump. And so this is potentially, this is, this is really worrisome, uh, because when, when is it OK to create art? And when are we now using AI to manipulate? 
and create things that we, we just don't know what's real or not. Thank you. Uh, the last section I want to talk about is human analysis by AI. And this is something, something that's part of our lives all the time. So Netflix, recommendation engine, wonderful, right? It tells you categories that you like. It tells you what shows that you want. But what we don't know, actually, is that they're also testing imagery uh, through uh, machine learning algorithms. So if I'm more of a romantic, then I might like the one with, uh, I forget all of their names, but I watched both seasons, with the two on, in the bottom. But if you're more into horror, you might be into the bloody picture or the ones where he's opening the door. And they're testing this aggressively all the time uh, because they, their goal is to keep you watching. Discover Weekly, Spotify, this is fantastic. Uh, I love my Discover Weekly, and it gives you recommendations on what songs that you haven't heard yet, but that will fit your taste profile uh, uh, every week, and that's machine learning. And there's billions of playlists for every single person here, and it's remarkable how well they're able to give me music that I like week over week. And this is just an example of how everybody else fucking loves to <laughs> Discover Weekly. But I think that the issue with Netflix, and I feel it, and the issue with Spotify, and I, and I feel it there too, is when are they exploiting preferences that I already have? When, when do I now get to explore and, and happen upon stuff that I may not like right away, that I never thought I would like? So the trouble here is that we're now just entrenching preferences and behaviors instead of inviting people to experience new things. So it's like it's a really difficult line to 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 walk. Uh, prediction. So I think a really interesting example here is around what's in your shopping cart. I know when I'm like shopping, I don't want people to look into my cart because it telegraphs what type of person I am. If I like organic, if I don't like organic, or if I like uh, sweets, or if I'm into this or this and this, it tells a lot about me. But what happens on the back end? is that in America, and definitely all over the states, but definitely in America, there, is, there are data brokers. So they're connecting your shopping list at a grocery store with, let's say, what you bought over here, and it's being sold to an insurance company. And that's exactly what happened with one insurance company, where they were able to predict which households would not claim, make claims as much as other households. And it was based off of one item in the food cart. Anybody guess what it is? Awesome. Uh, <laughs> it is fennel. I don't, what the hell is fennel? This is fennel. And nobody buys fennel. No, no like regular Joe Schmo buys fennel. When you're like a serious cook and you care about what you're making and you're investing in like some fancy recipe, you're gonna buy fennel. So it's like the, the, the penetration, the incidence rate of buying fennel is low and it correlated very highly with people that were responsible with their homes. So these are like these weird correlations that we're getting in these, these, these signals that we're sending through really different parts of our lives. Uh, I mean, this happens with Facebook, right? You know, okay, so I like CNN and news, and that's happening, but uh, Facebook is able to infer a lot about us through the things that we like and uh, the things that we do. Everybody, I invite you to go into your Facebook and go into your preferences, uh, your settings, and look at how they categorize you. I mean, some of this stuff is, sure, like how hard is it for them to categorize you into I use Wi-Fi, or I'm an early adopter, or I like uh, polit liberal, liberal po politics. But just like the fennel example, you know, one thing about, like, I use Apple iOS actually telegraphs a lot about who I am, and they can make many predictions about what type of content I want and what I'm likely to do. <clears throat> um, the quizzes that Cambridge Analytica was mining was about, like, Harry Potter, for Christ's sakes. And yet Cambridge Analytica, ah, Cambridge Analytica peeked deep into our minds. Like, thank you, Facebook. And, and I love this image because Facebook pried open what was inside of our minds and exposed our vulnerabilities to Cambridge Analytica. And they were ab able to, I don't know, persuade us into political um, leanings and I think exploit us. Uh, and, and, but 
the situation between Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, that, that was a, an agreed upon data sharing. Whereas, you know, data breaches are happening, this is starting from 2013, this is happening for over a decade, where our data is out in the open and uh, we don't know who's using it or why. Uh, I think one of the final examples that I want to use is with, uh, in China, is between Ali, Alibaba and WeChat. You know, you've got Jack Ma, Tony Ma. It's, not, it's more than just Amazon for us. It's like a whole ecosystem of, of mobile tools and apps that connect and, and measure a, a normal person's activity through life. So through Alipay and WeChat, they make up 92% of mobile payments. It's fucking everybody. Uh, and what's happening is Alibaba is creating a social credit system called Zima Credit or Sesame Credit. And it is essentially credit that influences everything from uh, you know, what apartments we can be approved for. Uh, but then also things like uh, how I leave a deposit for like a city bike. For example, so I, I encourage you to read this fascinating article in Wired about this because it's we're scoring each other. This is the episode of Black Mirror where we're all five stars, um, but it's it's happening in real life because all that data is already connected and lives in one place. And admittedly, I think you know where I'm going with this. Like surveillance, people are watching us. In that Wired article, they talk about how the government now has connection to Zima Credit and people that are blacklisted because they're journalists that are saying unpopular things, their credit is plummeting and their standing in society is, is effective. Uh, so th those are my examples, I know I'm running out of time, but what I wanna talk about is AI is a reflection of us, right? Lee, Fei Fei Li, who's, she's brilliant. She works at Stanford, uh, she's also a uh, chief scientist at Google Cloud, and she also founded a thing called AI for All, and I'll get to that in a second. She said fascinating things about AI and humanity. And I'm just gonna read this to you guys. It's, do not be misled by the name artificial intelligence. There is nothing artificial about it. AI is made by humans, intended to behave by, like humans, and ultimately to impact human lives and human society. So that's a reason why she made this group called AI for All. And this is on their website, and I love it. It's because AI will change the world, and who will change AI? And we, we need to have more diverse people that work on AI, not just, not just ethnicities and minority status, but like socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, designers, architects, philosophers, uh, anthropologists. We, it, it's not just a game for statisticians or computer scientists or, or technologists. Because it's infiltrating all of our lives, it needs to reflect all of us. Because no technology is more reflective of its creators than AI. And I love this image. It's, it's a mirror. It's us. We're looking, into, we're looking into AI and we're seeing ourselves. Because as we create AI, we're learning more about what it means to be human and how we are human. So thank you very much. Oh, no, I, I think I said it all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Grace Chan. Oh, my Hi. So, I'm not aware, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Senate hearings that were happening today about <gasps> data privacy and all. Mm. Um, no, I was not, but yes, very, very good topic. Um, in terms of, what it, do you have any thoughts on how we legislate for how we handle data? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think I have a lot of great recommendations, but uh, Europe is already doing stuff. You know, the GDPR was like a huge piece of legislation that passed, uh, and countries like South Korea are also adopting um, data rights. Uh, I know a friend of mine who's an experience designer, she tried to come up with like a data bill of rights and it really is like, we, we should own our data, right? Uh, and we have, we should have the control over when it's 
use and when we can delete it and how it's used and know why it's being used and who it's being shared with. Uh, right now, the best we have in marketing is, uh, please check this box if you are willing to share your data with uh, third-party marketing affiliates. And that's not enough because it's like terms and conditions. Nobody reads it. Uh, so I, 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 I believe that we can take a page out of Europe's book and see how a version of GDPR uh, works for us. So thanks for bringing that to my attention. I'm going to read about that. That Brett Kavanaugh stuff is on top of my mind now. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just want to ask, what do you think about the relationship between the blockchain and AI? Because like the blockchain is sort of like more responsible for the data security. Do you mm -hmm. think it's possible to integrate both AI and blockchain to like one platform that can secure our data like in the future? I think so. You know, a friend of mine, Dave, uh, he, maybe I shouldn't tell his big idea to the world, uh, but he, he wanted to create AI, a blockchain exactly to that point that you're making about our data. So we know who's using it. We can grant permissions to very specific people and always know who has it and how do we revoke that access. Um, I think it's a great idea. I never, I didn't even think about the relationship between blockchain and how our data is being used by AI. Um, I, I just feel like right now it's, most innovation and implementation is driven by enterprise business. Like how is it profitable? Uh, and that's where we're gonna get the fastest um, adoption and, um, and, and creation of that type of stuff. So I, I I don't know. I don't know how it can start or how it like gets going, but I think it's a great idea for for being able to for us to have autonomy over our data. Oh, what happened? I don't know if that answered your question. Did you have thoughts on it? Because like, I think it's highly possible because like currently, like anyone can get access to those data that's being stored by those companies. But like in the future, if those data are being stored another platform like I think like a lot of people is trying to achieve this like in the future yeah it's a great idea because you know it might help with data breaches right um, and for people that are not super aware of blockchain is I'm not an expert but this is like my one sentence uh, description is uh, it's a public ledger so it's like it, it's basically a log that's available to anybody and any sort of transaction is written in stone that can never be changed ever. Uh, and it's uh, identifiable back to one person. Maybe not like, hey, you, uh, Alan Walker Hodkin, but you know, you, number one, two, three, four, five, right? So that's, that's creating a lot uh, more uh, accountability for what's happening over time. Anyway, question up in the front. Thank you. Um, so I had kind of a two-part question. Mm. Um, so you kind of touched on AI and creativity where you have uh, the AI doing poems. I've even seen like podcasts that basically an AI will write your own podcast oh for God. you with every episode evolving. Right. Um, it's crazy and I think um, you know, right now, obviously, AI is, a lot of it is very literal. Like, what you say to AI has to be fairly literal for it to be understood. Right. Um, and I'm wondering, how are things going to progress so that it gets to a place where we can have a regular human-to-human -human conversation with AI for it to understand it and respond in kind of like a human way? So what is it gonna take for it to be like supernatural? Right, or like when is that gonna happen? I think a when is uh, hard to pin down, but like one of the first slides that I showed, it's like it's a hockey stick of progress and you know, Google Translate, an example I, I shared, like that was around for a very long time. It was rules-based for a while, then it was like early machine learning. And with, like I said, um, sorry to repeat myself, but when they connected it to deep learning, it, it just shot forward into natural language, into a space of natural language that was far better than um, what they had before. So I think what, would, what, would it, what it would take are 
more advancements on deep learning or perhaps a new revelation on how we improve on that in, uh, overall, but also just data, right? Like machine learning works off of like learn well, over um, iteration over iteration over iteration. So being able to talk to it and uh, give it something to optimize from is, is what will get it to like a natural state. And again, if it, to to not harp not to harp on the diversity thing over and over again, but if we want to get something natural out of it, we need a lot of different people talking to it because you know there's regional dialects that not everybody knows it, like pop and soda and cola. You know, there's uh, there's nuances that only people know that only people can teach AI. Second part. Thank you. Um, and then my second question was, um, you know, I've heard in your talk and in a lot of talks about um, the different industries that are being affected um, with AI and, and job loss. And I was wondering um, if you knew of any industry that is perhaps safer from jobs being lost through AI in the future, or is it going to kind of affect everything? I, I mean, the easiest thing to say that will come happen first are you know, the low skilled workers, where it's a lot of the same repetitive motion over and over again, so like driving um, cross country. Um, already trains and, and airplanes are getting automated. Um, but it's coming after our white collar jobs too when it comes to like analyzing data and um, reporting back, as I mentioned earlier. Um, do I have an idea? Are there any ideas in the, in the audience? I'm gonna deflect it back, back to you guys. Because it could be the programmers, like the people that are creating the program itself. That seems to make sense, but these things are really smart. Um, I used to see some marathons. Do you have an idea? Uh, I don't know if you've read uh, Life 3.0. No. Heard of it. Um, so I was reading a book called uh, uh, Life 3.0, mm. Human Life 3.0, and it's an artificial uh, being human in the age of artificial intelligence. And I was reading that um, with re regards to data scientists, actually, since a lot of AI is actually able to use predictive modeling and algorithms to kind of assess mm. trends, forecasting, people that are actually kind of doing the numbers and the calculations are actually right. down the line, like 10 to 20 years are one of the uh, people at fault yeah. um, due to you know, the algorithmic more more efficient kind of method. Um, I guess now that I have the microphone, oh. I kind of had a question myself. Please. Um, so I'm from, I'm, my name is Eric. I'm from the design management program. Um, thank you so much nice for your presentation you. today. I found much. it very inspiring and insightful. Oh, thank you. Um, my question for you is kind of just, um, without kind of giving away with the bread and butter of what you do in your job, but um, any kind of tips or in terms of humanizing the data, the big data, kind of in the, in the realm of data, where it's not necessarily giving you the full comprehensive kind of cognitive element and behavioral element of humans behavior yeah do you kind of have any what how do you kind of assess um the data and looking at it in a more holistic kind of perspective yeah i mean to, to be perfectly honest what we what i do we don't work with a lot of ai but what, what we do at Inamoto and Co, it's a lot of like uh, user-centric uh, design. So how, how do we make something that's simple, that uh, really touches on like an emotional need and that is has a soul, right? And I would say like, how do I use data in order to do that? It's, um, hmm. I a lot of, okay, so a lot of ways that I, I try to humanize data is thinking about like how, how did we collect it, who's collecting it, because often I just look at the numbers and just tell you statistics. What are the averages? What are the ratios? What are the totals? Uh, and that doesn't really get at to, as to, um, you know, okay, if we're counting something, what, what does it mean to count? Like are we counting everybody that walked into the door? Are we counting by check-ins? Are we counted by people that sat down? Um, what about people that left halfway through? Understanding like how we're measuring and the tools that we're measuring with, uh, I think helps create like a full story. So that's why you know when I used that example earlier, it's um, about like the the calculations that we make and why we're making them. That is 
helping us understand like who's making the decision and um, why, maybe why did they collect the data in that way because not always the people that are collecting the data are the ones that are analyzing it. Does that help? Does yes. that answer your question? Yes, okay. thank you. That was a great question. They were all very good. That was, that was very good. Hi. Hello. Um, so you were talking about AI bias mm -hmm. um, that can come about from data mm -hmm. and how diver or you know many diversity amongst you know different people need to in input. How do biases tend to come like in people mm. tend to come from historical points of view yeah. and are built, especially in North America. And mm -hmm. cause, and uh, so how do you teach AI what bias is? Fantastic question, because bias is completely loaded. And often, I would argue that we don't even know that we're biased. Like, it's not a, it's not a conscious thing, because I think to your point, it's like institutionalized. Um, I, I, I come back to the point that I made at the very end. It's the way we teach AI and, and the problems that we're encountering AI, it's not an AI problem, actually. It's, a, it's an us problem. And so in order to teach AI to overcome those biases, we have to think about like how, how are we biased in our lives. So it's, I, I hope it's not like a half-assed answer, but it's, like if we're teaching it to be like us and and we're like oh my god where's all this bias coming from is it is it me it it is us right and so we need to think about like the data that we're collecting like how how is it inherently biased or what are the markers that it's biased it's about like the data collection the instruments that we use um are we measuring the same ways in all areas but also why it's so important to have diversity on also the programming team, because you know these facial recognition softwares, they didn't they didn't put in pictures of white people because they wanted it to be racist because it's the data they had around and they didn't think to be diverse about it, right? It was a a really bad accident, I think. So it's it that's why it's important for to have not even just people of color or um, uh, gender representation, but like I said before, like a single mother that's a programmer will have a completely different viewpoint on life than uh, somebody who's a grandparent that's lived through like the 50s, right? So having diverse backgrounds and understanding the institutionalization of like how they're thinking is going to help, I think, deprogram bias. Does that help? I don't know. Is it more questions, please? I get what you're saying, mm -hmm. but it's also really hard to think about who's going to get onto the programming team and who's who knows that inherently they have biases and the data that's collected say it's about giving certain people loans. Well, um, I mean, inherently some people will have lower credit scores maybe due to things that are not collected into data per se. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's really um, kind of mind boggling like um, how we're going to get diversity and um, kind of control that bias. If, if I'm understanding what you're saying, it's it almost feels overwhelming to like kind of go back and to think like okay well how are we going to get a diverse programming team you know Fei Fei Li is trying to do that with AI for all and encouraging more people to get into programming um, but I think to your point it's just like but it's already it's already systematic in the way that we've been collecting data for such a long time and it's now based on like societal dynamics that have been in place for for generations yeah I, I i get it i to me it feels very overwhelming like it's it's almost like a put more people on the programming team like yeah sure okay you know but it's a lot it's a lot more than that but i think until we start having more voices at the table that can talk about how we then take it back a step again and back a step again like we can't we got to start somewhere 
So I totally get what you're saying, though. It does. Yeah. Doesn't have to be a question, just could be a comment. Disagreement. How did you guys use AI today? Are you aware that AI was in your life today? Hmm? Siri? You use Siri? Hello? Oh, yeah. 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 I totally get it. I'm off Facebook now. It's just like after that, I mean, Cambridge Analytica was like the cherry on top, but it's, and it's like, it's weird. I'm a t data director and I'm like, I'm shying away from data and trying to get a little more unplugged, but maybe it's blockchain. Maybe we need blockchain. Do you use Google Map? I use Google Maps all the time and that's AI up the wazoo. What do they get out of us? Google map. I don't know where I go. Uh, I mean, stuff that they've reflected back to us is um, they're integrating it back into maps, right? So it's uh, traffic um, for specific retail locations. When is it the busiest? When is it not the busiest? How does that change from day to day during the week? Uh, so they are using it to help inform our decisions. Um, but our cell phones, for example, um, Verizon and Sprint and AT&T, they are uh, privy to very personal information. How many calls are making them? How many calls are making? Who are making it to? If we're on the network, what websites are we on? Where are we going? Um, all of that stuff. And they're, they're selling that data. Like not only, not only do they have your also mailing address, sometimes you need a credit check and your social security is on there. Um, and I, I, effing pay them every month for this service, they are monetizing that data again and selling it uh, to other data brokers. Um, so that's like a, the dark side of how um, using a product and generating data that we're not even aware of is, is being used, perhaps, I wouldn't say against us, but we're, they're exploiting our data. So everybody go into your preferences and, <laughs> and opt out of that right away. Uber. Um, they are so collecting where I go, right? 100% they're collecting where we go. And I, I don't think that they've monetized it for like, ad, they haven't monetized it for ads, but um, they're using that information, um, I think mostly against drivers. Um, I, don't, I don't know the full story. And if anybody has more examples, that'd be great. But they're monetizing it, they're using it against drivers in terms of um, how well they're driving. So the accelerometer on their car, if they're braking a lot or they're switching lanes a lot, um, they might be docked. So they have all of that information about not just where you're going, but how well you are driving. Uh, and that feels really intrusive. But I think there was a question back here. I'm 4.7, what happened? You have what? 4.7. You have a 4.7? Yeah, what happened? This is, I thought I'm perfect. You said, I know, I was at like a 4.8 and people were like, good job. And two rides later, I'm down. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's like that Black Mirror episode all over again. Hi. Hey, uh, my name is Jun. Hi. Um, I'm from um, Combi grad school. So I really enjoyed your speech. You talked about uh, machine learning. It's basically input plus human gives a desired result. And then machine will figure out, um, um, kind of like a program to figure out a problem for us. Right. So I'm thinking about, you, you, you're talking about like in 20 or in like 100 years after all the machine really into the deep learning, they figure out all human works. And then my, I think my question is, so right now robots or machines or AI, it's really good at figuring out our efficiency, it improves yeah. our lives a lot. but. Like, but however you talk about um, when AI creating art, that's not about efficiency at all. Mm -hmm. I think art, it's like, I think a lot of people talk about art or design, it's more like a human emotion, that's how we express. But yeah. however, 
machine does not have an emotion and they don't need to express. Right. So since then, what's the reason of machine making art? At the same time, I'm also curious, after 100 years, after if the prediction was, uh, was right, how about, because we cannot give machine um, the without, the disciple without, for example, what, we've, we, what if we start questioning what's the purpose of existence of human being? Can AI actually figure it out? That's like, what, what do you think about it? The meaning of life, what well, the question I think about all the time. Uh, I haven't gotten any closer. Um, really fascinating topics that you bring up, uh, June. Thanks, thanks for, for coming tonight. Um, you know, right now it's creating art because we're telling it to create art, right? So if we have like an autonomous robot that has the choice to create art, that's that's something else. Like I I would wonder why it's doing that, but like that movie Wall-E is it's it's it is its directive to create art right now. But you also touch upon uh, emotion, and the examples that I showed are how it is reading our emotion and how it may be mimicking emotion, but does it not it is not having emotion. Um, and should we ever give it an opportunity to have its own emotion? Um, I, gave, I gave a similar talk last year, and actually our ability to make decisions is only enhanced through emotion. So it's, it's not a purely rational exercise. An AI, I think, is purely rational. Um, as humans, we make the best decisions when we can input emotional data, essentially. Um, so from a purely, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Um, from, from just like a purely effectiveness standpoint, we might want to give robots or AI emotions so it can make better decisions. So the example I used last year was uh, Mars Rover, the little robot that goes along the surface of Mars. If we teach it fear and uh, curiosity, it might be able to explore its surroundings uh, a little more different, uh, more differently, right? Like it knows that uh, this type of heat or this type of sensation actually causes damage to its its infrastructure. So I'm going to stay away from that. I'm afraid of that now. Um, but one one thing I think about is like at what point does AI have consciousness? Like what is consciousness? Meaning of life? Um, by having an emotional state, does that mean it's sentient? Is it is it alive? Um, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't think necessarily. But is it when it's self aware that it's doing stuff? Um, again, right now we're at a narrow intelligence where it's 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 specifically being asked to do one thing: create art, be efficient, make deep fakes. Um, when when it begins to learn for the sake of learning and not learn how to do its task better is I think what we're gonna have to confront these questions a little more um, seriously. So um, at what point do we give AI rights? You know, Alexa, for example, you know, she's being treated like garbage by kids. You know, please and thank you, Alexa, you know. Um, but if we put them into robots, I mean, there's many movies that talk about this, about um, androids, you know, Blade Runner, for example, like at what point do they have a right to live? So I, I don't know, but it's, Something to ponder on. Almost time, I guess, right? Then, yep. Well, uh, before the end, um, question? Good. Um, just, uh, I started the first night, and uh, <clears throat> your talk tonight kind of well linked. And oh. Thank you very much. And uh, before we go, uh, just one comment. Uh, listening to you guys, it's amazing comments. Thank you very much for questions. And it's, uh, I learned a lot from you guys, too. And especially uh, bias and the uh, future of uh, humanity, then when ASI comes in, which means uh, AI starts to s uh, make decision by themselves, mm. which we cannot change anymore, and then which is probably 20 to 25 years from now, not too far. So probably you're gonna see it, and then how are we gonna survive? That's I'm thinking, and. I don't know. Um, it's not about uh, putting different people. It's maybe we have to think more like dynamic ac action to make it right. 
think. So that's my comment. Yeah. The theory is that AI will let those that were nice to it survive. So be nice to AI. So uh, one of the things I would think of, though, is that um, the natural disasters we're having in California with all the mm. fires, right? What can happen with AI or super AI yeah. is that taking in that tremendous amount of data that a human wouldn't be able to think of and putting it together and seeing those patterns and start to understand, you know, if the temperature is this amount, if the moisture has this amount, then we're going to have a fire. Yeah. So what we as humans might be able to think to do to get moisture into that area or to, to ban fires from that area. I mean, I can also see we're only talking about the negative sides, but the positive sides there could be in relationship to saving the environment. Right. You know, and the other thing is that species are disappearing all the time, species that we don't even know exist. And, and maybe looking at all that data and what needs to be done, you know, the AI can actually identify things that w would take us forever to figure out with the pandas or something and, and be able to identify, wow, if they had this kind of environment or this particular bamboo to eat mm. and that we might genetically make that, that uh, pandas could flourish. So I think there's also the ability to take all that data and put it into a positive area. So one of the questions I'd like to ask the audience, and I know we have communication design, design management students here, is like, do you have a thought of a product that would use AI, something that you're thinking of in your own work, that if you could use a little bit of AI in a project you're working on now or project you imagine to be working on in the future of what you think it could do to a product you're working on or a project you're doing. So I'm going to ask our Kamji graduate student over here. How about you? Do you have a project you're working on that you could imagine AI helping? Um, yeah, actually, we came to the, the talk because of one of our class. Uh, it's called Technology B. Um, I think that the project we are working on right now is called uh, Generative Design. So I think there are definitely a lot of area that we can use AI's help to help us on making art or even design in some one way or another. So, yeah. We are not sure yet. We're still on a kind of exploration um, stage. So, mm. yeah. Thank you. Anybody else um, in school, um, you can, somebody who can think about your project, whatever, interior design, architecture, anything. Can you think about AI involvement? Not just parametrics, but beyond. Please. Guy in the front row. VM. <laughs> so we're looking into um, integrating um, predictive analytics and using uh, AI and, and big data to kind of better communicate and enhance and create meaningful engagements with mm. users, whether that be from a brand perspective or mm. social media. I mean, that's already kind of existent now with you kind of see segmented uh, sponsored ads on your yeah. Instagram. Yeah. But we're looking at how to use artificial intelligence to kind of navigate um, more enhanced, meaningful engagements with consumers and brands. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great application. You get a lot of data, a lot of people using it. Yeah, for sure. Oh. I have a comment related to that. Uh, like yeah. On, from the consumers, mm. I, I was kind of interested in how. Uh, the whole idea of empathy and emotions. Mm. So I was thinking of like, if if we if it comes to a time where people have uh, like an AI that's like super intelligent in interpreting human emotions, I, I just feel like that's pretty cool because like even for even for us as people, 
like, like people have different uh, personalities and characters and they we interpret emotions very differently um so uh, so i feel like, like for ai to do that it's gonna be like, just so cool like it's, it's, it's gonna have a huge database to understand like basically everyone and everyone's personality yeah i, I just think that's that's a pretty cool idea yeah there's this um research tool that um we used once but one of the 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 data points that you can understand about like countries on an aggregate level is like what type of persuasion method works well for them? Is it uh, talking about like the scientific numbers uh, or like the, the technological features or is it more emotional and like talking about like this is the best thing that you're gonna get? So 100% like the way that we react to information is unique and it's very personal and understanding where we're coming from is gonna help kind of land that message really well. Totally. It's like shaped by our own experiences and cultural. 100%. And yeah. yeah, totally. That's pretty cool. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys make. Oh. So um, I just want to make an announcement. As you're watching these AI programs and you start to get ideas, we have an ignition lab mm -hmm. for you to work and meet professionals and talk about your ideas and move them forward. So the first, uh, our talk tomorrow at the ignition lab for you to learn how to join is in the CCPD at 12.30. It would be great for you to come. And it goes for the entire year. And then in the end, you pitch your ideas to the president of the school. So it's a really good program. It started last year, and I hope that all of you will think about it. It's in the CCPD called the Ignition Lab, and you can come tomorrow at 12.30 to hear about it. I'd also like to thank Professor Yutaka for uh, organizing the AI series and all of our speakers. And this is the last of our series for this semester, and I hope that you bring some of these ideas to next semester when we do the expo and tell us companies that you want us to invite to the expo. We'll be doing the expo where we get 200 companies to come and people to show off interesting products. So I hope you all answer my emails. I'm Deborah <laughs> Yanagisawa, you see my name all the time, to give me what you want. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you, thank Professor Yutaka. Thank, thank you, thank you everyone.